Welcome, folks. Thanks for being here at the Washington County Public Affairs Forum today. We've got, uh, I believe, Commissioner Brad Vakian. And I want to let you know that over the next two Mondays, we will not meet. But when we reconvene again on January 6th, we'll have the Northwest Independent Writers Association. And then following that on January 13th, we've got uh, Doug Hoy and Eva Calcano presenting on the Aloha Community Library happenings. Also want to let you know if you check the newspaper, they just uh, raked in about $25,000 in grants this year on really doing some remarkable things over there. On January 20th, the Westside Cultural Alliance presents. January 27th, we've got Washington County District Attorney Bob Herman. And on February 3rd, TVCTV's Kevin Howard. Since we are broadcasting on cable access, it'll be a particularly uh, interesting program. We're going to discuss uh, franchise fees, which has some implications for urban services, and then just also what we do here to get the program out to the masses. On either February 10th or the 17th, we will have uh, Helping Empower Youth, which is a drug prevention group that focuses on the Hillsborough Schools Present. On February 27th, we'll have, uh, you can give us a wave here, John, John Hutzler, County Auditor Presenting. And then uh, recently added is uh, Dr. Jeremy Brown, who's the new president of Portland Community College. I want to thank John Leeper for making that suggestion. Uh, that, uh, that booking went va very, very smoothly because they're like really excited to be here. That's all the bookings that I've got to announce, and that does bring us uh, close to the election season, which will conclude the balance of the forum year. Uh, with that being said, I would ask that you do one thing for our speaker. Would you please put your hands together for Bully Commissioner Brad Avakian. Well, thanks very much for that. And uh, I think before I make a few remarks, I first want to wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays to the four members and to everybody that's out there uh, watching. Um, and, and also want to want to thank the uh, Washington County Public Affairs Forum. You are really the place for those of us who live in Washington County to have a great discussion about the current events of the day and to be able to do it uh, on uh, televised like this so that the entire community can participate. Uh, I just want to thank you for what was a great year for you last year and just a great legacy here in, in Washington County. Now what I thought I might do is I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about what I do uh, as a labor commissioner for you in the state of Oregon and, I, and then I want to talk about a couple things in particular that we're doing at the Bureau that I thought you might find very interesting. Uh, and then I know you've always got uh, terrific questions, so we're going to leave plenty of time at the end uh, for uh, anything that you might, uh, might want to talk about. Now, for those of you who don't know me, um, uh, you know, I grew up right here in, in Washington County. As a matter of fact, just a few miles from where we're uh, gathering uh, today, uh, as did my wife, Debbie, who grew up in Washington County. And we still live in a house about three miles from the childhood homes that we grew up in. And uh, our son, Nathan, and daughter, Claire, both grew up for, through the Beaverton School District. And of course, they're, they're off at college now. Um, but Washington County has been our home since, uh, uh, since, since we were kids. Uh, and I had the uh, great privilege of representing parts of Washington County down at the state legislature when I was there. But you know, for the last five years, have been serving as your commissioner of labor and industries. And it's my job as commissioner to lead the state's Bureau of Labor and Industries. And you know that uh, uh, we make sure that people are kept free from discrimination on the job or in, uh, in their housing or in all public places. We make sure people get paid a fair day's wages for a fair day's work. Um, but some of our greatest work comes not only from the enforcement side that I just mentioned where we protect workers, but from the side of the, the agency that works hand in hand with Oregon's business community to help uh, Oregon's businesses be successful. Our technical assistance program fields about 20,000 calls a year from Oregon businesses that are looking for their help navigating their way through complicated state and federal law and we help them do that. Uh, we trained uh, uh, thousands of managers in Oregon businesses last year in employment law to help them stay within uh, the framework of state and federal laws. 
And we have a very large hand in the state's workforce development system. Uh, we uh, certify all of the state's apprenticeship training facilities. And that side of what we do is what I wanted to talk to you about first. Because um, I have to tell you, I travel the state and I talk to a lot of employers who either are here and want to stay successful and expand their business, or even out-of-state employers that would like to come to Oregon but are concerned. And I have to tell you, they're not talking to me about wanting to take away the rights of workers or lower the wages in order to be more competitive. Across the boards, what I hear from employers is they want to know where they're going to get their locally trained workers that have the exact skill sets they need in order to produce the goods and services uh, that they sell in order to succeed as a business. They want to know where their locally trained workers are going to come from. And you know, that's an important question, not just for the businesses, but for workers and for our community too. Um, when you look back over uh, the history of our state and our country, we have always been the strongest when we have had a strong middle class being paid a good living wage that can not just take care of themselves, but had enough money to reinvest back into their communities by buying goods from the local businesses that sell them. A strong middle class like that is good for businesses as well as good for individuals uh, and families. And we've lost sight of that a little bit as we see the rich get richer in this country and other folks middle class struggling and a growing poverty class. And in Oregon, you know, we are always the first to go into a recession and the last to come out of it. So oftentimes because of the specific industry sectors we have in Oregon that are highly volatile, um, we get hit harder than some. And so for us in particular, it's important to make sure that our folks have enough jobs that they're working and that our employers have enough workers locally that they can succeed too. On top of that, one of the crises that we have seen in our workforce in Oregon is the age of it. <laughs> We've got folks in the building trades. These are your carpenters, your electricians, your cement masons, the folks that lay the asphalt on the highways. The average age in that industry sector is in the late 40s to early 50s. The Pacific Core line workers, the ones that put down the lines when they blow down in a storm, the average age is 53 in Oregon today. That's the average. You look at your community colleges, the average age of a community college student is in the late 20s. Go back about 15 years, the average age of an apprentice in Oregon was 19 years old. The perfect age to get somebody skilled up and ready for a living wage job today it's 28.2. So we took it upon ourselves at the Bureau a couple years ago to study why it is that was happening in Oregon. Because it's not good for our workers, and it certainly is not good for our businesses that need skilled workers ready to do the job. And I tell you, the results were stark. When you track back to the point that those ages began to climb like that in Oregon, it correlates perfectly with the time period that we began systematically eliminating shop class from our middle schools and our high schools. What we've seen is that you've got young folks that graduate from high school or that drop out, and they're wandering around for six or eight years before they find themselves on some kind of a path in a community college program, in an apprenticeship program, or they, they just happen to find a job. And it's not a good thing. So what we did is we pulled together a coalition of, uh, of folks uh, to go down to Salem and to find some way to bring those programs back. Now this coalition were the, the labor unions and the business associations. They were the Democrats and the Republicans, not groups that you normally see holding hands and walking into the state capitol together. But they did for this. And about a year and a half ago, the legislature passed a bill to create a grant fund in the Department of Education 
that would see the return of these programs. Uh, they put a little bit of money in it. The result, this year when school doors opened for returning students, 21 middle schools and high schools had fully restored 21st shop class programs. It was a terrific first step. It was so successful, in fact, that when the legislature came back to meet this session, they quintupled the amount of money in that fund. And by this time next year, we are going to see 50 or so more middle schools and high schools with fully restored programs in all four corners of the state. And one of the things I want to note for you is some of the leadership in getting that done, not just for local schools, but for schools all over the state, was your own Washington County delegation, and in particular, one of your newest uh, delegates to the legislature, Representative Joe Gallegos. So we are off to a terrific start that we think over the next eight more years, as long as the legislature keeps refilling the grant fund, we'll see a presence of career education back in every middle school and high school in the state of Oregon. Now these programs um, uh, include the traditional types of shop classes that you think of, your, your uh, uh, um, wood shop and your metal shop and your welding, the kind of things that can get somebody ready for a great uh, career right out of high school uh, without a college degree. But you're also seeing a wider variety of 21st century types of shop classes come back. I want to tell you about one of them. Way up in the northeast corner of the state in a place called Joseph, Oregon. Do you all know where Joseph is? Yeah. In Joseph, Oregon, when that application came in, I thought for sure it was going to be for a Future Farmers of America program. And one of the reasons we went down this road starting a couple years ago was because we wanted to see the rural communities with their traditional industry sectors of uh, farming and fishing and timber supported by these types of programs, Future Farmers of American 4-H. And we did see a lot of Oak Ag come back with the return of these programs. But the, from Joseph, Oregon, they had a whole different idea. You see, they have a very high unemployment rate up in the northeast corner of the state. And in order to address that unemployment rate, they decided uh, that they wanted to attract manufacturing back to Northeast Oregon. So a couple of their really sharp high school students got together with some local business folks and some parents and teachers. And they created this new program that teaches these high school kids how to write and use CAD software, computer-aided design software. This is the very kind of high-tech technology, cutting-edge technology that controls robotic machines to stamp out component parts for about anything that you want to make and sell. And I'm telling you, if you are a manufacturer anywhere in the world and you want to set up shop somewhere that will have a locally trained workforce in the exact cutting-edge skill set you need to sell, make goods and sell them, you cannot do better than Joseph, Oregon, right now. And the land's cheap, you say. Well, anything, yes, and the land's cheap. Uh, so they are now moving into a step where their community is going to start marketing this. I think it's going to pay off in spades for them. Or take the program that we saw come out of Silverton High School in Silverton, Oregon. I walked into their classroom uh, a few months back, and you see tables kind of like the ones you're sitting around with groups of students. They each had a DeWalt power drill, the kind of thing that you'd build a cabinet with, and a tibia and a femur with a bunch of elastic cord. Because these students were learning how to reconstruct a blown out knee in their sports medicine pre-med class. That's what Silverton decided to bring back as a 21st century shop class. And even more than that, they used some of their grant money to beef up the, um, the uh, biology and anatomy courses in their middle school so that middle schoolers coming up were fully prepared to take advantage of this pre-med course at the high school. 
23 of the 25 kids in the class that I was uh, visiting that day uh, uh, wanted to become nurses. And I'm telling you, any kid in that class uh, with the kind of experience they're going to get is going to have a leg up on applications to nursing school anywhere in this country from anybody else. So 21st century uh, shop classes today means the return of the traditional crafts that we remember as a shop class, but it also means a broad array of career possibilities for Oregon high schoolers and a terrific pathway into community college, into higher education, into apprenticeship, if that's what it is that they choose to do. So I have uh, nothing but optimism about where Oregon uh, is headed with respect to, provide, to providing the, the most skilled and ready workforce that frankly you will be able to find anywhere uh, on the globe. The other thing that I'm so excited about with the return of these programs is uh, even though Oregon, like I said, is oftentimes the last to come out of a recession, the nation really looks to us as leaders in some particular areas. One of those is natural resources. And these programs that are coming back, many of them in agriculture, many of them addressing sustainability issues in our environment and in our forests, many of them the traditional crafts that build things uh, are going to fit right with some emerging industries that we see that deal with natural resource management. The other is healthcare. Oregon is still viewed because of what we did at the Oregon Health Plan and other areas in healthcare because we've got uh, a fantastic school up at OHSU. The nation looks to us as a leader in healthcare and we expect some of the uh, best living wage jobs to come out of emerging uh, uh, types of industries in the health in the healthcare uh, sector. Uh, and so we are poised well with the programs we're bringing back to take advantage of the jobs that we expect to be coming from those industry sectors in, in the future. The second thing that we're working on at the Bureau that I wanted to give you really kind of a sneak peek at um, uh, is this. It has to do uh, with providing equal opportunity for every Oregonian on the job and addressing, frankly, a civil rights transgression that has been unaddressed for far too long in every state in the country, including Oregon. And that is the fact that women in Oregon still only earn about 79 cents on the dollar compared to their male counterparts in similar jobs, that minority men earn even less than that compared to their white male counterparts. And if you're a minority woman, you earn even less than that. Pay inequality uh, uh, is something that it inhibits people from finding uh, equality on the job and having a fair shot uh, like everybody else has. Uh, and so a couple years ago, you may know I created the Oregon Council on Civil Rights. This is a very diverse group of folks. And they were tasked with getting ahead of the curve on important civil rights issues for the state to provide advice to me, to the Bureau of Labor, and to all elected officials on matters regarding civil rights. The first issue that they took up was to provide recommendations to me and the Bureau on an action plan that would not close the gap between men and women and minorities and white men on the job, but that would eliminate the wage gap in Oregon. And they have just provided me their set of recommendations. And in the next couple months, the Bureau will be taking those recommendations, putting them into an action plan for the state. Now, I wanted to go through with you a little bit about how they got there, because I'm telling you, this is a remarkable effort that has never been seen before here. You all know the wage gap has ex existed forever and continues to exist. And even though we passed laws in the, in the 50s and 60s, state and national, that made it illegal to discriminate based on wages, you don't solve these kind of problems by enforcement alone. So the Council on Civil Rights took it upon itself to study what Oregon has done, 
to study what every state has done to address the issue. I tell you, when you do that, you don't find much. Um, not because nobody cares, but because it's a very difficult nut to crack. So they then decided, well, let's go outside the United States. And they began studying what other countries have done to address the pay gap in their countries. Um, and again, you don't find much. So Oregon is really carving a new path, a new way of addressing wage disparity. And, it, and I can tell you this much about what I think the plan is going to look like. It is not going to be solely enforcement based. Now, if we at the Bureau find cases of intentional discrimination that has resulted in, uh, in women being paid less than men or minorities being paid less than white men, we will enforce the law aggressively and hold wrongdoers accountable. But we know in order to change the dynamic of wages on the job, what you really need is a shift in the business culture that gives everybody an equal shot. And so what the council has recommended in a general sense and that we will be looking at and putting together a plan is actually creating a portfolio of women and family friendly policies that if adopted by enough Corporations in the state of Oregon over time will put people on an equal footing on the job. Let me tell you what I mean. One of the things that creates the disparity on the job between men and women is, of course, the fact uh, that women are still the primary caregivers in our families. So even if you come out of college together and end up at a firm in Oregon together, a man and the woman starting equally, at some point, uh, women, many women leave to bear children and to raise children. Later in the careers, oftentimes they're taking care of el elderly parents. And it pulls them out of the workforce at, at strategically important times when they should be gaining experience, having promotional opportunities, and those things are lost because they're raising uh, our families. And I just don't believe that there should be a penalty like that for motherhood. In fact, I think it should be recognized for the incredible value, the necessary value it has to society. And so adopting policies that are more flexible on the job, flexibility in scheduling, uh, the establishment of daycare facilities in our workplaces, uh, the ability to be able to take time off when you have to take care of yourself or a child or a family member and have it be paid rather than losing money, which is more difficult on women than, than men, um, are all important policy uh, considerations for companies to take up today. And frankly, if we don't do it, we will never be able to close the gap on the wages between men and women. So I think what you'll see coming out of this terrific effort is the creation of this portfolio of family-friendly policies, maybe something like for companies that adopt these policies and show that they're using them on the job, uh, they will become state certified equal pay employers and they will be able to use that certification in their recruitment and their retention of employees, allowing companies to get the top talent in the state because they can show that they're going to take care of, uh, of their workers. Uh, additional trainings for employers and assistance from our technical assistance program in order to encourage employers and help them to adopt and to use these kind of policies. And it's our hope that as employers uh, uh, change the environment in their own businesses and enough of them do it, that over a period of time you will actually see a shift in the attitude and the culture of business here in Oregon in a way that achieves uh, equality for everybody on the job. So I wanted to mention those two things to you in particular. I think they're terrific for the state. These are real efforts that I think are going to change uh, the environment here in Oregon and transform um, not just business environments but create opportunities for people on the job like we have really never seen, uh, never seen before. 
and are also just great examples, both in terms of career education, like the shop classes in the schools, and providing equality on the job. Um, uh, problems that exist everywhere in the country, and once again, it's Oregonians that are crafting a terrific solution uh, and creating a model for other states uh, to follow. Um, with that, I want to thank you once again for asking me to come out and, uh, again, just wish everybody just the greatest of holidays with their families. Um, and uh, if we're ready, I'm happy to take a few questions from folks. Rob Solomon, forum member. Hi, Commissioner. I'm wondering, with everybody talking about how important living wages are as far as the job creation is concerned, I'm wondering if you think a $15 minimum wage is viable, and if not, why not? Yeah, Rob, I really appreciate the, um, uh, the question, because as many of you know, I announce the minimum wage in, in Oregon uh, every year. Uh, and you may know that, uh, that starting January 1st, it's going to go up by 15 cents to $9.10 an hour. We're the second highest minimum wage uh, in the nation. Um, uh, with respect to what your minimum wage, where the starting point is, I think every community has got to decide that for themselves. But let me tell you one thing that Oregon has done uh, that uh, has just been a terrific success for us in 2002, you know, the voters of Oregon uh, decided to tie our minimum wage to the consumer price index. And so every year, if the consumer price index goes up, then correspondingly, the minimum wage increases. It's our way of making sure that our lowest wage earners never uh, lose pace with the rising cost of goods and services. Um, so it protects the lowest wage earners. At the same time, that 15 cents, that modest 15 cents an hour that it's going to go up by um, is a pretty steady and predictable type of an increase in the minimum wage. Businesses need to be able to figure out what their expenses are going to be in the upcoming year. Tying it to the CPI gives businesses a steady and a predictable method of calculating their costs. And on top of that, that 15 cents for the roughly $100,000 minimum wage earners that we have in Oregon is going to mean more than $20 million of increased consumer spending going back into local businesses, especially small businesses. So the way we've done it in Oregon is not only steady and predictable, it's good for the worker, it's good for the business uh, both. Uh, and so the way I would answer your question is just that, you know, you pick, the, you pick where the starting point is based on what your community needs, but tying it to the CPI uh, has been a great success story for Oregon. Thanks. Uh, John Bell, board member. Uh, I'd like to know what we uh, increase in. We, we got your CHOP program now going to 20 schools a, a year. And I figure we got at least 200 schools that need to have that program. At that rate, it's 10 years. How can we accelerate that to 40 or more a year, rather than there's 20 new ones a year? And if what happens to when the ones that the last year's 20? They get to get keep on going so that the well, 40 hour, uh, 40 shops or 60 shops for the coming year, 2014-15. Uh, yeah, uh, John, uh, we, we did 21 schools this year. Okay. By this time next year, you're going to see approximately 50 additional. Additional. So, a bit, so we will, we'll be up to a total of, I haven't seen the final number, but we'll be up to a total of, I think, 60 to 70 by this time next year. Uh, and then we will refill the grant fund if the legislature does that, and I think they will every year until they're all done, and I think there's even more than 200 schools. Yeah. I tell you, I, I, would love, I would love to do it all this year. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see those programs come back to every community in one fell swoop. Uh, given the 20-year disinvestment in those type of programs, I think the legislature is doing a tremendous job in creating the grant fund and committing to refilling it every year so that we're on pace to achieve it eventually. 
And with the 60 to 70 that we're going to have restored next year, we're ahead of where we thought we were going to be. So I think it's all good news. Um, with respect to continuing the funding of those programs, uh, you're right. This money helps start up the programs. The districts that are getting these grants are all agreeing to continue uh, the programs with their own budgets. Uh, but that is an extremely difficult thing for them to do. And uh, I, I know the Representative Gallegos and others uh, from the Washington County delegation agree with me, but we have got to start investing in our K through 12 public schools in a way that allows them to create these programs and to keep them. And that means fully funding our K through 12 system at the quality education model. And that's what it's going to take to have a real success with these programs. Thank you. Bet. Hello, Marilyn. Hi. Marilyn McWilliams, forum member. Um, my question is uh, related to John's that uh, we, we need to have schools preparing students for jobs that are out there. But I wonder, is there a mechanism for the feedback from the business to communicate with the schools in a way that's easy for businesses to know which schools and, and how to communicate what particular skills? And then also the, the teacher preparation programs that would be necessary to prepare teachers to do this kind of training? We, um, uh, in creating this grant fund in the Department of Education, uh, my biggest role in that, um, in the process of selecting who gets the grants is that the governor or the governor's designee and I jointly appoint the selection committee for, for, for who chooses where these grants are going to go. And that selection committee by law includes uh, not just professional educators but um, uh, and other folks at large from the community, but specifically folks from various business uh, sectors uh, in the state. And that is done because in reviewing w which schools get grants, we're looking for two things in particular. One of them is um, whether or not the curriculum closely meets the, um, the needs of Oregon businesses or emerging industries nationwide and that um, uh, the school or the district shows close community partnerships also supporting the program and oftentimes that comes from labor or from industry sectors. And so the whole selection process incorporates key folks from Oregon's business community to make sure that we're, uh, that we're meeting those needs. With that said, I, I want to be clear about one thing with the return of these programs, and that's that um, even though these programs are going to be a great support network for Oregon's business community or for attracting businesses to the state of Oregon that want a good locally trained workforce, uh, these programs don't exist for that sole purpose. The purpose of our public education system uh, is not to churn out little worker bees. Uh, the purpose is to raise uh, broad-minded, uh, healthy, uh, well-educated individuals that are capable of taking on anything in life, whatever that may be. Uh, and so these programs that are coming, at, uh, coming back not only create a good workforce, but they're going to provide the kind of well-rounded education that we need just to grow good citizenship in our state. Uh, and for my money, I will tell you the same exact thing about the need to return music and art programs in Oregon. And as soon as we get these shop cl classes back, uh, that's where we're headed next. Thank you. Hi, Brad. Hello, Ted. You already know what I'm going to ask you about, uh, <laughs> the one you didn't want to ask her. Um, and I understand it's not your job. I'm not sure I understand why it's not your job, but, I, but you told me it's not your job. So, um, and I will say I certainly understand the um, impact of our ports on our economy. So, um, I wonder if you could explain what the governor did. Um, and maybe in explaining that, you, should, you could kind of explain why <clears throat> a group of people that probably ought to be in jail got rewarded in this case. Well, what, um, 
I guess this gives me a chance, Ted, to actually ask the question myself, because I don't know if you gave enough for people to know exactly what you're talking about, but I'm happy to do that. And, and it wasn't that I didn't want to answer the question. It's that it, it's, it's this area of labor is a little outside my role as labor commissioner, but let me explain it. Uh, what Ted is talking about is the dispute that you saw in the newspapers between the electricians union and the longshore union at the ports in, in Portland and that that dispute was actually causing many carriers to go right past the port of Portland and up into Washington in order to drop off their goods and, uh, and it was not a good situation for the workers, for the ports or for the, for the state e economically. And, uh, last week, uh, Governor Kitzhaber brought uh, those unions together, uh, hammered out some tough choices uh, between them, and uh, it looks like the ports will be open for business. And some like the result, some don't like the result, but it's going to get uh, goods moving through Portland again for now. Let me answer the question this way, um, because uh, the reason I said it doesn't fall squarely within my role as labor commissioner is uh, is the jurisdiction that I have generally as labor commissioner are around uh, protecting folks on the job uh, that don't already have protection through collective bargaining agreements or some other means. And so oftentimes when there is a dispute between two unions, both who have collective bargaining agreements, that dispute is handled in some other forum, the National Labor Relations Board, the court, or something of the sort, and that's where this dispute has, has, has mostly been, been handled. But I will tell you this, um, the, the lack of enough jobs in the state of Oregon has led to conflicts that uh, we don't like to see and that we generally have not seen in Oregon. Uh, many times uh, labor unions who have a duty to represent uh, their members as best they can and they find their members not working are doing everything they can to make sure when an opportunity arises to get on the job that they get their folks on the job. Uh, and what has always been a very cooperative labor force now is seeing themselves pulled and pushed at all different kinds of, uh, in all different kinds of, of ways. And this dispute that was in the paper so much is, 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 an, is an example of that. And, all I can tell you is whether or not uh, anybody agrees with the exact result, it's very important we keep those ports open, uh, that we keep people on the job, and that we keep commerce coming and going uh, from Portland. We'll see how this, uh, how this resolution turns out in the coming months. Hello, Wynn. Hi, Brad. As you know, I fight human trafficking. Wynn Wakala is my name. And I wondered about labor trafficking, anything new going on with that. I know for a while you only had two people on, have, has the legislature given you any more new positions? Well, the, you know, agencies in these economic times are learning to do more with less, and some agencies have experienced uh, deep, deep cuts. Um, I have to say the legislature uh, has, uh, has fully supported the mission of the Bureau of Labor and Industries, both in assisting Oregon's business community and in protecting mm -hmm. Oregon's workers. And we have seen a relatively small cut in comparison to other agencies. So I'm very grateful to the legislature for that. In terms of human trafficking, it's always something that we keep our eye on very closely. And uh, we don't prosecute criminally that would be the job of Oregon's district attorneys in cases like that. Well, what we do is we make sure that every person that comes to Oregon and does work here gets paid the fair wage that they're entitled to under the law and has good working conditions that they are entitled to. And uh, if that means that folks are uh, being trafficked to Oregon and forced to work, uh, we at least make sure that they get the wages that are due and then we'll work very closely with district attorney's offices if it's a proper case for a prosecution uh, uh, as well. And when you've kept in great touch with the Bureau, you're one of our best uh, resources, and it really remains a priority for us if we see those situations to make sure they're addressed immediately. Hi, Brad. I'm Bill Kroger, a forum member. <clears throat> Excuse me. I appreciate your coming today, and thanks for your service. I have uh, two quick questions. The first one is, uh, related to uh, teaching or working with uh, young people in high schools and things about various careers. I was wondering if Intel and uh, 
Tektronix and the big companies like that were involved in any of those kind of programs. I know that uh, they do stuff with the community colleges, but I was wondering if they had gone into the high schools to do stuff. Second question is, and you probably aren't even connected with this, but but I'm, I'm really blown away by the problems with the website on this healthcare thing. And I was just wondering if you were connected to it in any way and maybe what's going on with that. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you too, Bill. Thank you very much. <laughs> You know, our, um, uh, well, earlier when I mentioned that Oregon is so dependent on certain industry sectors, timber and agriculture for one, high tech the other, and those are very volatile industries. The high tech industry in particular has understood that it needs a good locally trained workforce in order to remain successful. And Intel in particular has a great program with Portland Community College that it has set up in order to make sure that they get uh, workers that are skilled in the exact skill sets that they need. Uh, they also, as well as other local companies, have done a good job in reaching out to um, high school and even middle school uh, students in order to um, create interest and pathways uh, where later the kids can get the skills that they need for those types of industry uh, sectors. I don't know off the top of my head if any of them have, have a direct partnership with the types of grants that have been handed out recently. Um, but I do know that there has been a lot of interest, and I expect that there certainly will be a great partnership as we move forward. We're only in the second year now. But the other part of that is the community colleges have also shown great interest in partnering with high schools as these programs come back. So you are starting right at the beginning here. You're starting to see a confluence of industry sectors like high tech, the community college system, and K through 12 all coming together to create a pathway, quite literally, for middle school right to a living wage job in the high-tech industry. So it, it's right at its infancy, but what you described um, is happening. And I am going to totally and shamelessly dodge your question on the Oregon Health Plan issue. <laughs> yes, John. John Hutzler, forum member. Uh, Brad, my question relates to uh, your department's efforts in regard to wage disparity. Um, I, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the approach that you're taking, relying not only on enforcement, but in efforts to change the business climate, the business environment, and, and culture toward uh, wage disparity. You've, you've described some, uh, uh, some specific plans that you anticipate uh, to address those uh, cultural changes in regard to uh, uh, in regard to women's wages. I'm wondering whether in regard to minorities um, you're going to be relying primarily on enforcement or whether you have plans to address um, the kinds of cultural shifts that may be necessary to improve wages for minorities. The, some of the problems are similar and some of them are quite different with respect to why you end up with, um, uh, with uh, wage inequality between minorities and white men and women and all men. Um, but uh, there are cross sections in, in all of that as well, such as the fact that, um, that uh, a minority man may earn less than a uh, white male counterpart, but a minority woman is at the absolute bottom of, of the list. And so the combining of minority status with the gender gap is the worst of all. And so uh, um, a few of the things that I mentioned would be primarily focused towards women versus men. Part of the, um, uh, part of the, uh, the effort to close the gap between minorities and white men uh, uh, has to do with the family-friendly policies, but also the opportunities that you provide for education and entrance into the job market. Uh, one of the reasons, I didn't mention it, but one of the reasons that we went down this road for the return of shop classes so strongly was because when those programs were lost, we've witnessed a higher adverse impact on young women and minority students than young white male students. So that creation of that pathway is the first step towards finding equality and a fair shot at a job. Uh, in our apprenticeship programs, 
very interesting thing in the last uh, in the last year. You know, a, a, apprenticeships are a way of getting young people trained up for a particular type of career. The great thing about them is, you're not only being educated and provide get taught a skill, but you're earning money at the same time because you're on the work uh, on the job learning these things. Whenever there is a um, uh, we slip into a recession, you see a loss of job availability and a corresponding loss of apprenticeships because there's nowhere to put them. In the last year uh, and a half or so, we've seen a decrease in the amount of apprenticeships, but because of the efforts, proactive efforts, to reach out to young women and minorities to be involved in apprenticeship programs, both by the Bureau of Labor and Industries and by the folks who manage individual apprenticeship programs, we've seen a decrease in the number of apprenticeships and an increase in the number of women and minorities that are participating. I mention these things because I think the absolute best thing we can be doing to close that gap is to make sure that we provide the opportunity in the first place to even have a fair shot at the job. And that starts with public education and apprenticeship programs. Harry Bodine, Forum member. Brad, going way back to the 1940s when I was a teenager, uh, I remember the end of the school year, the end of my junior year, and my allowance was cut off immediately, and my instruction was go out and find a job. And they were available. I remember I delivered papers when I was started 14 years of age, I think, and uh, there was employment and service stations. There were a whole bunch of things kids could do in those days. Those opportunities are not there now. Anybody who outside of the fast food industry, we put a lot of limitations. People who grew up in Oregon, probably everybody in this room picked strawberries at some point. You know, I never had that experience because I there were no strawberries where I was. But the, the environment's changed, and the laws have been very restrictive on hiring anybody under the age of 18 to do anything. So nobody learns how to work. You know, the work ethic is not established. There's no way you can, you can get there. Your your comment on that? Yeah, it, it it's a great. It's a great issue for us to keep at the forefront of our minds. Um, a lot of us that grew up in Oregon remember the days you're talking about, Harry, and you don't even have to go back to the 40s. You know, I grew up in the, in the 70s right here in Beaverton, and I was one of those kids that got up at the crack of dawn and went out and waited on the corner for the bus to pick me up and take me to some strawberry field. I think, I think throughout my teen years, I worked every berry field and, and, and hazelnut orchard in Washington and Yamhill counties. And it earned me a little bit of money, but it also taught me an awful lot, not just about hard work, but an awful lot about the land and the water and the culture of Oregon. And it had a lot to do with the way I view and love our state uh, today. And then my next job, since you happen to mention it, was pumping gas at the Flying A gas station uh, right out here on TV Highway, and or it was on Canyon Ro on Canyon Road. Uh, those kind of opportunities are important for kids, and kids kids are still working. But we want to do everything we can to make sure that those opportunities are available. Uh, when there aren't enough jobs to go around, what you actually see is you see adults doing a lot of the jobs that used to be done by teenagers. Now, when we were talking about the minimum wage earlier, people still think about the minimum wage job as uh, as as being some high school kid who's working a few days, you know, a few hours after school every day, and uh, and that that's that that that's who fills that's the profile of a minimum wage worker. Not true anymore. Minimum wage jobs are primarily filled by women, and a lot of them women with uh, kids at, at home uh, and adults. Uh, and so the profile is much different. The, the way, there's two ways to um, attack what you're talking about. One, one of them is um, we got to make sure that we're growing our jobs in Oregon. We need more jobs. The adults need to have living wage jobs that can take care of a family, not a poverty wage job like a min minimum wage jobs. And, and those, those jobs should be for folks that are learning and coming up in the ranks. Uh, the other is we need to make sure at the state and the federal level that we're not crafting policies 
that preclude young people from getting to work. Um, I have the ability to provide waivers uh, in industry sectors and it, uh, so that young people can get on the job. And I tell you, uh, as long as the job is safe and as long as it's supervised, uh, I will always give a young person a shot and provide a waiver to get them to get them on the job. Our legislature has done a very good job of finding creative ways, especially in agriculture, to make sure that kids can work and can work enough hours in order to earn good money. But the primary the primary solution is the creation of living wage middle class jobs for the adults. Hi, Brad. Phil Nelson, Ford yep. member, and sure glad you're here today. Um, <clears throat> My concern really is with income inequality in a broader sense, uh, or in a broad sense. Understand the United States, we have the highest per capita income of any country in the world. And yet we're sitting here with shortages of uh, funding, for instance, for education. Oregon now, I think, stands about the fourth from the bottom in the United States among states providing support to higher ed. Uh, we're always trying to get more money for education, uh, K-12, and community college. And I'm wondering if there's anything being done through your bureau or in the state to address the problem of what seems to be pretty aggravated income inequality, which has risen since I was a kid. I used to be able to work, for instance, a summer job and pay for my tuition in college at a private university. Uh, and I know there's no way now when uh, that can be done. The law school I went to was $250 a year, University of California. That tuition is now $47,000 a year. I mean, this is in 40 years. And we're seeing some pretty extreme uh, things going on and corporations asking to be excused from paying state income tax and such. And so I guess I'm just asking, what about income inequality and are you going to solve that problem? <laughs> I. Um, I'm going to give you a very serious answer to that, to that question because I, I, I think not just in my role as labor commissioner but um, as somebody who has devoted his career to public service now, I think every person in public service has got a duty, an obligation to have that issue at the top of the list. Um, uh, whether it falls squarely under their job description or not. And you brought up several important factors under this broad category of income inequality. You hinted on uh, tax fairness. You hinted on the high cost of education. You hinted on the uh, decreasing numbers in our middle class and the increasing numbers in poverty wages and the increasing numbers of the ultra wealthy in this country. And all of those things are important factors in income uh, inequality. The answer to your question is yes, I am doing something and I'm going to continue to do something. Providing the best trained, most ready workforce that you can find anywhere on the globe and attracting businesses that come here with middle class jobs is one of the best ways to make sure that our economy stays strong, not just for the state, but the economy of a family stays strong. Um, I will never uh, uh, relent uh, on um, ensuring uh, one of the highest minimum wages in the country. Now, the minimum wage anywhere in the country is a poverty wage, and we need to look at it as that. But I'm going to make sure that our lowest wage earners never fall behind the rising costs of goods and services so that they can take care of their families as best as they, as best as they possibly can. With the issue of tax fairness, the middle class families in Oregon have taken on the burden for far too long uh, of a system that used to be more balanced between the contributions of families and the contributions of corporations. Corporations pay a much smaller share of the total tax burden in this state than they used to pay, and that balance needs to be reestablished. And lastly, we're taking our young, talented, eager talent in Oregon that are graduating from our universities, and we're throwing them into the economy burdened with fifty dollars or $100,000 of debt. Now, folks from our generation used to see that kind of a debt when we bought a house. 
But today's generation is seeing it before they even get started in a career. I think it is, it, it is a ridiculous way to build a society and to maintain a strong economy. And there are lots of ideas out there now about how to address the issue of the high cost of higher education. And I tell you, I give a gold star to anybody who's, uh, who's contributing to a solution there. But let me tell you what I think it ought to be. I think higher education should be free. College should be free. And in many places in this country, it used to be free. One of the first public schools that this country ever saw, the University of Virginia, that was started by Thomas Jefferson. Once he established the university, the first thing he did was he went to Congress and said, okay, now you have to pay for it so that it was equally accessible to every person that had the ability to learn. Because the understanding, the whole basis of public education is that it is equally accessible by everybody because that's how you develop a well-educated citizenry that can support the democracy. And somehow we've turned that notion of higher education into making our colleges and universities profit centers that necessarily increase the cost of tuition. I say every student that graduates from an Oregon high school, uh, pick whatever GPA you think is acceptable, ought to be able to get into an Oregon university get two years of tuition fully paid for, and in exchange, they do two years of public service when they're done. I think that's the real answer. Uh, hello, Brad. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, John McWilliams, board member. Um, along this uh, pay equity uh, line, um, I have a question on a little political. I don't know if you can answer this question or not, uh, but we have uh, something that went through Wisconsin uh, I believe North Carolina, other states as well, and it's called the right to pay or the work, right to work, right to work. and so uh, that's coming to Oregon too. That'll be here in the form of an initiative this election, <clears throat> and I'm, so I'm wondering what you're feeling about that because to me that's the, it's out to destroy a union so that so they can no longer do what they do, and and uh, the younger people going in who don't have that history aren't going to know what's going on. So they're not going to be involved too. So can you comment on that or not? John, um, John brings up this notion of the so-called right to work movement. Um, what, this, what this does uh, is, is this, is, is, it, is it, it's an attempt, it's an attempt to bust unions by saying um, that union members don't have to pay their dues. That's in effect what it is. Uh, and uh, it's caught on because of uh, because of huge money that has gone that opposes uh, workers' rights and that opposes the formation of unions in places around the country. Huge money has gone in in order to persuade people to adopt this so-called right-to-work policy. And and here's here's where those the notion just fails horribly. Um, for folks who are, are real, um, uh, who, who appreciate American history and who study it and who understand uh, what was going on during the strongest times that our country has ever had, the time when we rebuilt our middle class, the time when folks had living wages and, as Henry Ford said, the ability to have a wage and earn enough money for you and your family that you can actually purchase the product that you're building on the assembly line. You know, these are truly American concepts that support American businesses and American workers both. The times when that was strongest in our country and where our economy was driving the economy of the world was the time when unions were strong, when unions provided a balance in the workplace, not superior power, not inferior power, but a balance in the workplace that said workers need to have good working conditions, a fair wage, in exchange, and benefits, and in exchange for that, we're gonna do everything we can to make your business as successful as it possibly can be. And when that balance was in place, American industry shot through the roof. We were the most successful country economically in the world. We had the highest standard of living. Workers were making as much money uh, 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 as uh, you know, as they as they 
could within that balance and it supported their families and they were paying tax dollars and it supported our public schools. <clears throat> when you strip away the right to collectively bargain, when you take away the power of the worker, you not only hurt the worker and the worker's family, you upset that balance and it disrupts uh, the successful American company that is based on productive labor as well. This effort on right to work is un-American. It doesn't reflect the strongest times that our country has shown in creating that balance between labor and workers. Uh, and you better believe, it if that fight comes to our state next year, uh, that I will be there helping lead the way to protect workers in this state and create that proper balance between workers uh, and their employers. Thank you, Brad. Uh, it's great seeing you up there. I heard all my questions answered today. But again, I wonder, isn't uh, the highest minimum wage somewhat inflationary? Doesn't that give the uh, politicians, and I love to think of this country as a civilian politician, civilian military, and now they're professional politicians and professional military, military uh, among other things, but it's still the idea, this professionalism is really uh, inflating our society, our money base. Your comments, please. Well, give me just a little bit more with your question. I want to be able to give you a full answer to it. Don't you feel having the highest minimum wage or the second highest minimum wage is inflationary? Mm. Well, you know, like I said, every community has got to choose where that starting point is for them that's appropriate to their own local economies. And, you know, Oregon, uh, like I said, um, uh, tried to create a predictable system where it was not over-inflationary, if I can add to the term that you used, that it was uh, a starting point that was appropriate for our Oregon economy, but then uh, did not jump ahead of it by making sure that it was tied to the rises in the consumer price index. And I think that has proven to be uh, very successful uh, here uh, in Oregon. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Uh, oftentimes in, uh, you know, uh, well, first of all, you don't see as many in opposition as you see in other states to uh, the, the minimum wage as you do here in Oregon. Many of Oregon's industry sectors accept it. They understand that it works for them and it works for their employers and it's stable and predictable. Uh, nationally, you see, for instance, the National Restaurant Association that says that minimum wages like that in Oregon actually decrease jobs, you know, are, are putting up too big of a burden on especially small businesses who have to mm -hmm. keep up with the rising cost of goods and services. But uh, the number of small businesses since 2000 has grown since 2002 when we tied our minimum wage to the consumer price index and even the national restaurant association nationally says that they expect oregon's restaurant industry to continue growing at a higher pace than that nationally and so i think oregon has really found the sweet spot with its minimum wage to take care of its lowest wage earners and at the same time provide a stable and predictable method uh, uh, for calculating the wage for its business sector as well. Thank you. Folks, I'm going to call for some applause for our amazing team. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Brad. I'd like to conclude today's program and end the 2013 forum season. There's a gentleman I'd like to uh, uh, remind you about. His name is Paco, and he's probably working for close to minimum wage in your tips. So if there's one program where you should crack the wallet and tip generously today, it would be for our server, Paco. Uh, with that being said, I'd really like to thank you for being here, and we'll see you next year. Bye-bye. <laughs>